Hello, good evening. Welcome to our regular board meeting of the Shawnee Mission Board of Education for February 25th. Our first item of is to have the Pledge of Allegiance, and we welcome the students from Corinth Elementary to come forward and help lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Great. And Mr. Lowe, would you like to introduce uh, your team from Corinth? Thank you so much for uh, letting us come out tonight and lead the pledge. I'm Chris Lowe, Principal at Corinth, and I brought some representatives from the Corinth Student Council, and they're going to come up and introduce themselves and share one thing that they have enjoyed uh, as being a Student Council member. So come on over, Student Council. My name is Jacob Wien, and... One thing that I enjoy about Stuco is helping lead the announcements in the morning. My name is Ellie Moylanen, and my favorite part about Stuco is writing the MC notes for the PBIS assembly. My name is Vivian Fraley, and um, my favorite part of Stuco is probably helping with the PBIS assemblies. My name is Kate Gary. I enjoy writing the uh, kindness posters. My name is Bridget Cronin, and I enjoyed helping all the activities with the teachers. My name is Mira McKinnis. I enjoyed uh, making thank you cards for all the teachers and staff members. Again, thank you so much, board, for letting us come out. And also, our uh, student council sponsors, Ms. Mahaffey and Mrs. Molteni, um, help lead the students in the leadership activities throughout the school. So thank you again so much for letting us come out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. I have a feeling that's not their last, last elected office on that student council. <laughs> There's futures there. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item 1.03, and that's the adoption of the agenda. I'll seek a motion to adopt. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Mack. So moved. I'm sorry. Second. Second. And thank you, Dr. Sinclair. All those in favor of adopting the agenda, please present. Please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. That passes 6-0. Uh, we move on to item 1.04, which is the approval of minutes. I'll seek a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting of February 11th. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Zila. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Owsley. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. That passes 6-0. And we move on to item <clears throat> 2.10, and that's the superintendent's report. Dr. Fulton. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. Well, we want to start off with the uh, Shawnee Mission South students. They earned the state championship title at the state academic decathlon competition. This marks the 20 first academic deca decathlon state championship for Shawnee Mission South in the past 23 years. The team is now invited to advance to national competition in Minnesota in April. Congratulations to those students. We had a team of five students in Shawnee Mission School District's Culinary Arts and Hospitality Signature Program that earned second place honors at the Wiley Hospitality and Culinary Academy High School Culinary Cup Challenge. They received a silver medal as one of 14 participating teams, and all Shawnee Mission competitors received a $500 scholarship to Johnson uh, County Community College. Congratulations to our culinary arts students. The National Merit Program announced that 12 Shawnee Mission School District students are National Merit finalists. These students took the 2017 preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, which serves as an initial screen for 1.6 million program entrants each year. The students have an opportunity to advance in the competition for the National Merit Scholarship Awards. And so congratulations to our National Merit finalists. And then um, finally, before we get to the Shawnee Mission All-Stars, We've had, incredibly, some questions about whether or not the Shawnee Mission School District 
will need to adjust the school calendar for students due to the number of snow days that we've had. And I know the seniors are especially and very interested in hearing this response. So uh, here's the good news. Shawnee Mission built four snow makeup days into the calendar. And per the audit guide for the Kansas State Department of Education, the number of hours that may be forgiven are equal to the number of hours designated to be snow day makeups. In other words, for every snow day that the district schedules, the state will forgive an equal number of days. Since the district built in for snow days, up to eight snow days can be used without having to adjust the calendar. So far, we've used seven. Let's hope that we don't use any more, and certainly no more than eight. So far, seven days have been used due to inclement weather. Therefore, one additional day is still available to use without having to add days of school to the calendar. If we use a ninth day, everything changes. But let's hope that doesn't happen. Right now, we're in good shape. And that Great. concludes my re that part of my report. But now, we are going to uh, recognize the Shawnee Mission All-Stars. Great. Thank you. Who do we have first? OK. <laughs> First, we're going to uh, uh, invite Jennifer Wolliver, principal from Rosen Elementary, to introduce our first recipient. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Bolton. It's hard to follow up on a snow day that we don't have to make up any, but I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> I just want to tell the Board of Education that I have an all-star at Roseland. Um, her name is Miss Laura Newcomb. She is our pre-K teacher. And I have to say I'm very lucky because many times you guys know what it's like as a kindergarten parent, but imagine pre-K. And knowing that Laura is the first person that these individuals see is really makes me feel very comforting because she's so positive whether she is smiling greeting the students singing i mean she just builds that a relationship right when they walk into the door and i have to say is it continues on and builds as they go through roseland and so she definitely is an individual i know her family's here tonight as long as with a lot of staff members but i'd like to congratulate miss laura and we're going to watch a short video clip so thank you i have a Hi. Hat, kangaroo. hat and a kangaroo, kangaroo. a kangaroo. So you're gonna look at your letter and decide which one is my letter gonna go under. I nominated Miss Laura. This is her second year here at Roseland because of the teaching that she has done and the relationship she's built with families. Our program is now at full capacity and it's really nice to see how she's developed the program and I feel very blessed to have her as the first individual that parents encounter because she just builds that relationship and what Roseland is all about right from the start. She is so patient with children. I mean, I cannot fathom honestly what our kid would have done last year without her as a teacher. Um, she was somebody who thought of ways to just help him succeed in the class um, in really inventive ways that um, I'm not sure other people would have been able to do or see. So she's just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, she does too. She just has a very gregarious, uh, contagious uh, personality, uh, sense of humor. Um, I really enjoy her presence. She is truly a pleasure to work with um, and a blessing to be around. Miss Laura treats all her kids in her classroom almost like one of her own. She knows each one's loves and likes and dislikes, while at the same time she sets high standards for them and wants them to achieve the goals that she sets for them. Oh, your baby girl, and then they all had to sleep on the floor. Yeah, because I made them. She's always like gentle and approaches with a kind voice. Happy, she is a good teacher. She helps us and she plays with us. I can tell you are trying hard. Good job. Miss Laura is a very kind, loving, compassionate teacher who gives her all in everything she does, whether it is for her students, for her coworkers, for anyone she comes in contact with. 
I love the opportunity to visit her classroom and uh, watch her in action because it truly is magical. And Laura enjoys learning right alongside the students and many times they are learning through play. That's something that our early childhood educators are really passionate about and so I think that's um, a special quality she brings to the classroom. Congratulations on this award. I appreciate all that you do for our early learners every day. Laura, congratulations. Good job, Ms. Laura. You are an inspiring woman. Uh, it is truly a blessing and a privilege to work with you. Congratulations, Miss Laura. Thank you for all that you do for everyone here at Roseland. Laura, you know how much I am proud of you and how wonderful you are, and I'm so grateful for all you've done. Congratulations. Congratulations. Laura, I'm very proud of you, and I'm glad that you are Roseland's all-star. You've been a pleasure to work with the past two years, and keep it up. Thank you. And this is Miss Laura. We'll see if she does any of those dance moves that you guys saw in the video. <laughs> all right, first of all, thank you. Um, I am honored to not only be nominated, but then to receive this award. I was born and raised in Shawnee Mission, so I know firsthand all the inspiring educators that are in this district. The gratitude I have for working in this amazing district at the most incredible school and with the most supportive and loving staff is unmeasurable. Teaching pre-K, I am able to help parents and students experience the joy of school and learning. It is so important to me to build strong family and teacher partnerships so that we can provide the best team and support system for all of our learners. I always set a goal for myself to try and take something away from every educator I observe or classroom that I go into. Really, they are the people who made me the teacher I am today and the teacher I strive to become. So thank you. Thank you to the district, to the school board, to Roseland, to Mrs. Boulevard, um, to my amazing family, and all the educators who have supported me and are making my dreams come true. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, and now we welcome Richard Kramer, Director of Athletics and Activities, to welcome our next recipient. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. Fulton, Board of Education members. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to get to introduce an all-star tonight, and that all-star is Brenda Davis. Brenda is a remarkable person, and she's being recognized for her her wonderful talents and her storied career in Shawnee Mission. Brenda's been with us for over 28 years, and she started at Shawnee Mission South as an aide and secretary, and then was a principal secretary of both Santa Fe Trail and Comanche, and then became the secretary for the uh, director of curriculum instruction, Bessie Reagan, and then has been in her current role since 2009 as facilities coordinator. Uh, she's an, got an incredible work ethic, and she treats everyone as if that person's request is the most important. Um, she has developed this incredible trust inside our school community and with our patrons that when Brenda, they call for Brenda, they know that Brenda will go the extra degree to make and ensure that their request is met and is at least received and treated fairly. Um, she's very competent. She does such an unbelievable job at, her, at what she does. Um, again, her, her knowledge of our district and the depth of knowledge because she's been here for a while really connects to our patrons and those that want to use our facilities. And um, before, I, before I introduce Brenda, though, I do want to use these great words from Aristotle. And that is, dignity does not consist in possessing an honor. It's in deserving them. And Brenda is certainly deserving tonight to be one of our Shawnee Mission All-Stars. Brenda, please be, uh, come on up and help me uh, congratulate Brenda Davis. And why don't we go ahead and show the video. I love Brenda. She is always so helpful to me and I need help a lot. There is no bad days for Brenda. Every day she walks in and she is committed to making every experience 
that she has a contact with a positive one. And she always has that care and concern for others. She's very selfless. Well, we all got together to nominate her because she is an unsung hero and the things that she does is wonderful for the district. Brenda currently oversees every one of our facilities that can be rented and she is the sole person that uh, handles that job. Sometimes you just think these things get done uh, magically. Nobody gives it a thought process on, on exactly what it takes to do an event, to have an event in one of our buildings. People don't see what she does. I, I've only met her personally twice, but on the phone, it's like we're long lost friends. She's one of those people that, that's out on the front lines every day and a trench worker. She takes her lunch pail and her hard hat to work every day. Brenda's a great, great person and she deserves this award. She's understanding and she's uh, very organized and she works very well with the Shelby Mission School District staff. I'm always amazed when I go over there and see how much she has going on in the little space. Do I think she does not get enough credit? Absolutely. She's really behind the scenes. Definitely an unsung hero. Definitely. Well, I couldn't do my job without Brenda. Uh, Brenda makes me look a lot better than I actually am. When I have an issue or I need help, Brenda is the person I go to. Brenda, congratulations for being a Shawnee Mission All-Star. You deserve it. Um, I'm very proud of you. Congratulations, Brenda Davis, on receiving your Shawnee Mission All-Star Award. It is very well deserved, not only for all that you do for Shawnee Mission Northwest, but all that you do for the entire Shawnee Mission School District and community. Thank you. Hey, Brenda, congratulations on your All-Star Award. You deserve it. Brenda, congratulations. You are truly an All-Star and most deserving of this award. Thank you for being who you are. I just want to say thank you very much. I feel very honored, and I feel that I've, it's been a privilege to work in Shawnee Mission and to, with all the wonderful people that I've met over the years, and I've, I've learned a lot. So I don't, I think, it, I can think of a lot of other people that might deserve this besides myself, but I am very appreciative and I feel very honored. So thank you very much. Congratulations. That concludes my report. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fulton. We'll mo move on to item uh, 2.02. .02. Turn back to Dr. Fulton for a strategic planning update. Well, we're very excited uh, to bring to you tonight a draft, the first draft of a uh, report from our strategic planning process. A hardworking group of 30 people met uh, on f all day Thursday, all day Friday, and Saturday morning to build the foundation for our strategic plan. We talked about beliefs, mission, uh, objectives, strategic action steps that we need to take, uh, strategies that is, and parameters. So I want to share those with you tonight. Remember that this is in draft form until it is approved by the board in June. But what we also have said is this, is that we are going to focus on making sure that we are honoring the voice of each group along the way. Um, and I think I'm going to get some help from Mr. Smith here. We really started off talking about what was our vision for Shawnee Mission. Let's be aspirational where we want to take our, our school district. We have lots of strength to build on, wonderful history. Let's make the next 50 years as good or better than the past 50 years of being a unified district. And so this chart that you see in front of you represents that. There are lots of things that we just kind of do in the school district that we do based on inertia. Now we need to be very intentional about making sure we're meeting the needs of all of our students. Our beliefs that we came up with follow, and I'm not going to read all of them to you, but I'll give you a sampling. <laughs> we believe that Every individual has inherent worth and deserves to be valued and celebrated. That's an important belief. We believe a community's strength is derived from its diversity. And you see a diversity as a theme in several of those beliefs. 
We believe that you have to take care of people's basic needs, and we believe that relationships are important as well. Those are some of the themes that go through this. So these beliefs that you see in front of you, that's what guides our behavior. Next, and this is exciting, we wrote a mission statement. And I want to read it to you, and for the sake of the audience. The mission of the Shawnee Mission <clears throat> School District, the bridge to unlimited possibilities yet to be discovered, is to ensure students construct their own foundation for life's endeavors through relevant, personalized learning experiences orchestrated by talented, compassionate educators and distinguished by an inclusive culture, an engaged community, and robust opportunities that challenge learners to achieve their full potential. That is part of the North Star that can guide us for years to come. It is timeless in its statement. But along with the mission, you also have to have measurable objectives. These are the big levers that we continually push to make sure that we're getting better as an organization. And there are only three, but three are sufficient. <laughs> the notion that every child is going to have academic success through challenging, relevant, uh, personalized learning is a hallmark of this plan. We can create personalized learning plans. We will create personalized learning plans. And that will be part of our uh, challenge in, in our work ahead. We also want to make sure that students are academically prepared. We want to make sure they master the essential competencies that lead to college and career readiness. We'll need to define what those competencies are, not comprehensively necessarily in, at the minutia level in every domain, but big picture, what are those research-based uh, essential learnings that ensure that every child is ready for college and or for a career of their choosing? And then finally, we get to the soft skills. We want to make sure that students can interact effectively with others and that they're engaged, empathetic members of both our community and the global community. Those are the objectives that we will uh, continually go back to and measure. There are five strategies that we identified to achieve those objectives. Again, I, I won't read each of them, but they're helpful in their design. Um, Reimagining teaching and learning, thinking about building an inclusive culture, creating a climate where people can be successful in their work, designing systems that support our beliefs, missions, and objectives, and a fifth one, uh, recognizing uh, that we have to build on our tr tradition of excellence to have a, a strong uh, foundation of future. Those are our parameters. Or those were our, sorry. <laughs> David, there's another one. Did the fifth one get added? The one, yeah, we'll find it. Okay, the fifth one, sorry. I was, I, it switched on me. The fifth one actually had to do with facilities on strategies. Let me back up. Now let's go to parameters. On the parameters, these are kind of the guide, the, the guardrails, if you will, for our work. Here are the things that keep us on track to make sure that maybe as a shiny object comes along or other distractor variables come up, that we stay on track, making sure that we're meeting the objectives that we've set for ourselves and doing it in the way that's laid out in our, our uh, beliefs and in our mission. All of that now was put onto a uh, one-page one slide, a one-page poster. And this is what we put up in this room and, in fact, throughout the district. That now will guide our work for the years ahead. Um, the next steps are this. We are going to put together action teams, action planning teams, that will address the five strategies. The teams have the responsibility of identifying research and best practices. Uh, then that research is both external and internal to the district to identify how we can realize the objectives that we've set for ourselves. That work will begin uh, here in March. Tomorrow, we'll be sending out information to the community on how to get involved in the action planning teams, and people can sign up for one of the five groups. And the groups tie directly back to the strategies. With that, I'll make one final comment and then see if the board members who participated would like to add anything or if you have any questions. Uh, let me just say this. The, the two and a half days that we spent together were done 
as community members. There was no hierarchy in the room. There were 30 equal voices, representative of the depth and breadth of the district, who together coalesced, coalesced to realize what we see in front of us here. And with that, I'll, and I want to thank them for all of their work. At some point, they'll be at this meeting, and they'll, you'll have a chance to meet all of them. But uh, with that, I'll see if the, any of the board members who participated want to add anything or if you have questions. Reverend Guy. Uh, it was an amazing experience. It was an exhausting experience. Um, I, but I've never been a part of anything quite like that to truly have representation in this group of 30 people, including the five high school students who were remarkable and so important in this process. Oftentimes the adults would all get talking and get excited about an idea, but we'd remember to turn to the high school student in the group and say, what do you think? And, and that student might say something we hadn't thought of, and so a lot of what you see represented in these statements came out of the contributions of the high school students who were in the room. So um, I know it's a lot of words, and sometimes these words are used to be flowery and you know paint rainbows, and they don't have any um, drive behind them. But the 30 people in that room have all kinds of passion about these words and all, all kinds of intention that these words get fleshed out and enacted in all of our schools. And um, we wordsmithed <laughs> these things to death. Uh, I was saying to Mrs. Owsley earlier, I said, if I were gonna come up with a statement by myself, it wouldn't be this. Um, but I'm so glad that I had those 29 other people in the room to uh, help us come to what we have here. And each one of these words was chosen very specifically. Each, many of these words were debated for sometimes 20 minutes on one word <laughs> to get it to say as precisely as we could what we wanted to say. So um, I'm going to be very excited to see how this gets fleshed out and lived out in our community going forward. Mrs. Owsley? So I, I can tell that there's some members from the steering committee here tonight, and I want to say to everybody here or who isn't here, thank you so much for giving up um, basically almost three full work days to come and, and work on this completely in a voluntary capacity. Um, in my professional capacity, I work for an organization with a very strong agency mission and belief. And it is the core of what I do in my day job. We always reference everything we do back to the mission of our agency. And it really impacts organizational structure when you are constantly thinking of what your end goal is with everything that you do. And um, I'm a healthy skeptic of most everything. Um, and so brought healthy skepticism to this process, but was very pleased with the outcome of having all of these different um, community members from parents to students to teachers to administrators, principals, board members, um, coming together as a team to come up with what we believe both the mission of the Shawnee Mission School District is and, and how we want to implement it and, and where we want to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years. Um, and, and feeling that camaraderie and that um, that team spirit um, for that three days was very nice because we're not doing this as individual players. We are in this together and, and I thought that that was a very, I wish that the whole community could have, like we had live streamed it or something so that people could see how things came together because it wasn't all sunshine and flowers. It was constructive conversation. Um, the students really did keep us on task <laughs> in very successful manner. Um, and I, I appreciate having had the opportunity to do this. So um, thank you for coordinating it and bringing it to the district, Dr. Fulton. And thank you again to everyone who participated. And I really hope that people have an opportunity to read these um, and process the work that everybody did. Any additional thoughts? Or? I would just respond to any questions other board members may have. 
board member questions. And before we do that, if I could have the other members of the steering committee that happen to be here, Absolutely. please stand. I'd like to recognize their, their commitment and work. So thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Sinclair. Um, uh, one of the qu questions that I was asked about the process is that um, there was a, a very intentional effort to ensure that all voices would be heard and no one voice would be dominated. And I was just curious who could maybe speak to that, how that, how that played out in the, in the process. Well, the wonderful thing about this group, 30 individuals, representative of the entire district, and I can say that you ask committee members, you know, don't take it my word for it, ask the people that participated, there was, uh, there was a wide diversity of thought as we went through the two and a half days, and I think it really did represent a very broad perspective within our school district. And that, that voice uh, found its way into this document. There were lots of discussions about what should, what should our beliefs be, what, what should our objectives look like. And, uh, and I just, I think they did a great job of representing the district as a whole. But uh, there was no rubber stamping going on in the room, that's for sure. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Sure. Yes. And this is in some ways slightly technical in terms of answering, but the way uh, Dr. Gunn did the process was most of the work was done in small groups. And those groups changed. So you had folks interacting with different people throughout the three days. And the work products of those groups got reviewed by the entire team and got revised by different work groups. So just technically, it wouldn't, you know, all of the voices got a chance to weigh in. And the other part was he was very clear no one was going to be asked to settle. The things that, the products that were, were finally uh, put up and agreed to had to be agreed to, to by everybody. And I think the way that things moved and everybody had a chance to add their voices, by the time we were done, everybody felt like that was their work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other board member questions? I have one and that is, would you like to provide uh, next steps? I'll be happy to. We will tomorrow uh, be asking for uh, participation on the action planning teams, each, each team, and the teams will be aligned with the strategies. Uh, each team will have around 30 members. Again, we want to get broad representation from the district. We also want to make sure if a team, for example, is dealing with a strategy on uh, personalized learning experiences and we get people that have some community expertise on that, you know, we'd want to probably look for some university folks to be involved, that kind of thing. But um, again, those teams will be representative of the community. They will work until through the end of May. And then the steering committee will come back on June 5th to receive the work of those action planning teams and make final decisions about what will go into the plan. And then from that point, it will then come to the board uh, at that board meeting the end of June for final approval. We have a calendar of when all the action planning team meetings are and we'll make sure that that's publicly available and uh, certainly also specifically available to you. Great, Mrs. Mack. So I guess that, that um, provokes a question, is that, so the action teams are gonna be looking at this document for guidance and we haven't approved it. You will, you will you actually saying, you approve, you will actually approve the final document, which will include the work of the action, the action planning teams. I, I guess I, I, that, the, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. You don't actually, you don't actually interact with the approval until we get to the very end, because there'll be, there will continue to be feedback and refinement. We'll take this back to the steering committee at that June 5th meeting, and they'll make any kind of final revisions to the document, they'll hand it to me, and then I'll recommend the document to you. So, I mean, and, and that's what I'm, I'm, that's what I'm, I guess maybe I don't understand, is that the action teams are going to be using this as their they will. guiding, but it hasn't been approved by us yet. So that's what I don't understand. What, they are, what am I missing? Nothing. <laughs> okay. that, that's it. They, 
they will take the document that we have that the steering committee has provided them in terms of future direction and then they will work on the strategies to provide more detail to the plan not, not that I, I mean, I think you guys are no, doing that's great okay. work. I'm not saying no. that. It just doesn't make sense to me that they would be working on some, working under the parameter, parameters, beliefs, missions, et cetera, right. on something that we as a board haven't approved. Right. Yet. Well, and what will happen, too, is, is that as they go through their work, their work will inform, uh, you know, the effectiveness of what we've done so far as a steering committee, and the steering committee will have the ability to make any kind of final adjustments that they want to to this document before it finally goes okay. uh, to as a recommendation to me and then from me on to the board. So the action team may be bringing things that could change some of the wording or it something? It could. It could. Or inform it, refine it. But that would be up to the steering committee to make that okay. decision. Thank you. And, and to build on that question, so the document before us and on the board is not the strategic plan. This is Correct. the framework that then right. begins to be used to develop the ultimate strategic plan. That's, that's right. But this is an important component of it. Okay. That's that. As you'll see at the bottom, it says draft. Right. It's not final until it's right. approved by the board uh, in June. Mrs. Zila. Yeah, I just I saw Dr. Hubbard coming to the microphone, and I know you've been an integral part of this. Was there some other comments that you wanted yeah, to add? I was just thinking, um, Billy. <laughs> question was a little different twist than what we answered and so I was just going to add to that but then she said yes yeah, so did we answer your question so I thought you were asking about representation of the group not so much was the the group's voice heard but how we landed with the 30 I, I think that would be helpful too I mean I was I was trying to um, refine my question, but I, you know, I think that's a valuable part of the. And while I can't answer every single one of the categories, because in some cases it would identify kids and or their parent, but um, in looking at the 30 members, we really, we did the best we could to cover. Obviously the five feeder patterns were easy, but then when we got to the five feeder patterns to try to get as many schools within that feeder as we could. so. There were, I didn't count, but I wish I would have, how many kids were represented just by parents in the room because um, we, had, we had numerous kids represented by the 30 people that were there, regardless of what role that they played. And so we tried to you know, cover elementaries, we tried to cover um, different, the diversity was clear in the room. If you looked around, um, we had representation of special education, we had representation for pre-K, CTE, and we just tried to cover every gamut of the district that we could possibly cover. Did you also, I think, have translators that were needed at that? We actually had a parent that was non-English speaking, and so yes, we had a translator for her all three days. Um, we did some child care on Saturday, including myself on the floor. Everyone came in my office today and said, oh, you had little people in your office because we did some coloring in there. It was awesome. So yes. Thank you. Thank Any other board member questions? Yes, Mrs. I just, Mack. I just wanted to just say this is thank you. That was a lot of time, a lot of effort, and I know we all want to say thank you, yes. but I just, I, it, it, incredible. It was a great experience, yeah. for sure. Yeah, especially with juggling a very interesting week weather-wise and everything else, so thank you for your commitment. Any other thoughts? No. Okay, great. Thank you for that update. <coughs> and with that, we'll move on to item 2.03, which is board reports. I'll move through the various items. Uh, Reverend Guy, any uh, SMAC PTA update? I was not able to attend Friday. They had the principals and presidents breakfast. I was in the steering committee meeting, so I wasn't able to attend, but um, I think that went off very well. That's all well, I Well, I can to speak report. to that. Okay, go ahead. Because <laughs> I was there. Um, yeah, it was wonderful to see this room full of both the principals from the buildings as well as the PTA presidents. Uh, a very good meeting, uh, providing updates on what's going on within the district. Uh, some of the awards were, again, defined and encouraged folks to apply for those from the coming years. Um, <clears throat> ways to get involved in the R&D forum that was presented. Uh, that, come, that takes place this spring, and those updates were provided as well. And with that, Mrs. Owsley, uh, Foundation. Um, I don't have a SMEF update, as I was unable to attend the last SMEF meeting, but I did communicate to them, um, although I was absent, our appreciation for their assistance with um, 
helping to pay the expenses associated mm -hmm. with the consultant group that was used to facilitate the strategic committee, strategic planning committee the last few days. Great, thank you. And Mrs. Zila, uh, KSB Board of Directors? Yes, we have an upcoming meeting in, um, right before KASB, actually, uh, or NSBA. And uh, so we will go, it's traditional for the board president, who is Patrick Woods out of Topeka, to show the other board members around the district and just kind of familiarize themselves and introduce them to um, their school district. So that will be an interesting adventure. Uh, I think it's March 22nd and 23rd. So I'll give you an update on that later. Thank, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sinclair, legislative, anything going on in Topeka these days? Yeah. <laughs> Um, a little bit. So the committee has not met, but the advocacy team from KASB has been active in Topeka and I think looking for the respite in turnaround week with a little break from um, some bills that have been introduced that have not been so helpful and one or two that might be helpful to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your well-chosen words. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and uh, yeah, okay. go ahead. And uh, Dr. Little will be here next board meeting, I believe, mm -hmm. to provide us a legislative update, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Constituent Services, Mrs. Goodburn is not here. I do know that the group is meeting again this week and we will continue to the progress of that group. Professional Services, uh, Mrs. Zila, any update there? Um, well, yes, we have posted for the um, in-house counsel position and gotten several people that have applied for that. So uh, we'll, we'll remain open until we feel like we have found the right candidate. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item 2.04, and that's the board financial report. I'll turn to Dr. Fulton for the introduction of our presenters. Thank you, and uh, before Mr. Knapp comes up, I want to um, give you, uh, as part of that report, an update on our final adjustments to the Title I budget for 2019-2020. You know, as previously shared, uh, we've been working to uh, address a $1 million reduction in Title I funding for next year, and that's a direct result of reduced funding from the federal government. As a reminder, we are moving from 13 Title I elementary schools to eight. Any impacted staff at those schools will have positions in the district, and reducing from 13 schools to eight schools allowed us to save $407,000 of that $1 million in the Title I budget. <laughs> But that still left us with $688,000 of fixed costs to address. In that money were all of the district social workers and the instructional coaches at those schools that are no longer Title I schools. So I'm happy to share tonight that we've identified cost savings that allow us to do uh, that $688,000 in a cost-neutral way. And here's what we've done. I'm going to go do this a very big picture. We eliminated through retirement an associate superintendent position, and that's because of uh, Dr. Southwick. Uh, again, thank you for announcing his retirement in a way that allowed us to, to capture that savings for next year. We reduced administrative costs for early childhood by doing some reorganizing. Uh, Dr. Neal, who's in charge, Assistant Superintendent for Early Childhood, will next year assume the principal's duties. Uh, the principal who is currently at, in that program will take over the coordinator role, and the current assistant coordinator will remain in that role through the end of September, at which point uh, she'll retire. And so that allows us to gain long-term cost savings in that program while also meeting organizational needs. We've also, through reallocation, reorganization, and attrition, reduced additional cost, and that's reorganizing the way we do apartments, finding places in the budget where we could reduce costs, and so on. And that allowed us to save that $680,000. In fact, we did better than that. We were actually able to identify some additional cost savings that will allow us to, to underwrite that coordinator for a diversity position next year. In 2020-2021, we're gonna experience some additional administrative cost savings when we reduce two current cabinet level positions through retirement 
at the end of next year. And uh, we announced that at a previous meeting. And again, I want to thank team members on the cabinet, across the board, every single person who has worked both within their department and in their own personal job descriptions, and this has applied to all of us, to assume more duties to make sure that we could uh, realize these cost savings. So I credit them for their, their work and their advanced planning. Um, also, as a reminder, we are going to hire an in-house counsel, which is going to help all of us with some internal efficiencies and will, at the very least, be cost neutral compared to what we're spending now on outside firms. And uh, hopefully, and we believe it's possible, likely and even, that we're going to realize some cost savings in the operating fund by going with in-house counsel. But let's stay conservative and say, at the very least, we'll be cost neutral. We'll work to get beyond that. That, uh, that gives you an update on Title I. Do you have any questions on that before Mr. Knapp uh, provides additional information about the budget? Board members have questions specifically about the, re the update on Title I. Oh, okay, well, Mr. Knapp, we'll have you go ahead and come on up and do your presentation. And I believe the first slide on there is, uh, uh, gives you a little bit of backup to what I was just saying. Just for the sake of the audience, remember, uh, <clears throat> the cost savings, we, we had a cut in our federal funds on Title I. That's in that orange column. Yes. A million dollars less. We had to make that up through cuts because we had to shift 688000 of that into the operating side, and there was no new money to do it. So we had to do that with existing funds, and we did. So with that, Mr. Knapp, it's all yours. That's correct. Good evening. Yes, so to piggyback off what Dr. Fulton said, so when we, get, when we start looking at that orange column and that purple column out in the far right, they're designed to be self-supported, and if they don't end up being self-supported, then we have to supplement that from operating funds. So our goal is always to try to make sure we got our revenues matching our expenditures in those two areas. Um, so we presented this slide to you last month, and we kind of focused on Title I. Tonight I'm going to focus on the far left, the operating funds, and give you an update of where we're at in our current year's budget. Um, if we can go to that next slide. There we go. This analysis, we usually perform about this time. We, get, we want to get through about six months of the budget year and to do a really good, get a good comparison from this year to last year, get six months worth of actual expenditures in. So this is as of February 1st, but still some of our invoices lag about a month, some lag two months. Um, so I'm just going to start at the top and kind of work my way through this document. Back in August, when we brought the budget to you for approval, our surplus was $2,041,530, and that was prior to negotiations ending. So we kind of had that figure going into negotiations. Um, uh, negotiations concluded, and we added $2.9 million in salary increases. That was the step plus some of the stipend. Uh, so after we added that budget, um, to the original, um, excuse me, scenario, um, our deficit became $886,000 at that point. So our restated budget became an $886,000 deficit. And that's what we were going to start the year with, and that was our goal to try to recoup that and hopefully to get back to the zero. The revenue piece did its part. As you can see, our revenues exceeded our original budget by $826,000, so that's a good thing. Um, that's mainly due to our weighted FTE. We have been through our audit, and we know a lot of our weighted FTE is kind of locked in at this point. There's still some unknowns that will take us through May, um, but right now we think we're going to have about $800,000 more um, in our operating budget. The expenditures are what's letting us down this year. Um, right now we anticipate expenditures exceeding budget by about $1.6 million dollars. And there's a list of the things that are kind of driving that. Our salaries are anticipated to be above, and again, this is all over the restated budget after we added the salaries, $1.2 million more than the budget. And that's due to adding positions after the budget was approved. 
because we take this budget to you in July, um, and then things happen right after that because school starts in August, and you don't you always get your staffing right. So we added about 11 teachers and 11 pairs to the budget uh, after the, the uh, budget was approved by you. Substitutes, um, this again is certified and classified substitute costs, and we're running about $577,000 more than budget. Um, Kelly is still doing a good job. They have about 99.3% fill rate, so that drives the cost, but that's a good thing. That's the goal of the program. Um, and the usage for Kelly is up about 2% compared to this time than last time. So we've got a little bit more usage going on uh, with our subservices on the certified side. Our utilities, if you can believe it or not, our electricity is up. Uh, <laughs> goes along with the seven snow days we had. So we were, had a, we we're having a below average winter and we, feel, uh, we always feel for that in our electricity costs. Our health is riding about $400,000 up. We added about 80 new members in our open enrollment. So on our January um, invoices that I just got before I came in here, we had about 80 more members than we did in the month of December. The other, um, oh, and then Title I expenses. Um, Dr. Uh, Fulton mentioned how we're gonna handle Title I next year and the year after, uh, but it also has an impact this year. Uh, when we started the, the budget year, the plan was uh, that the general fund would absorb $336,000 worth of expenses in Title I, so it would break even in this year. Um, that's a very conservative number. Our hope is that's a lot less. We'll know more as we get closer to the end of the year. And those savings will come from vacancies and just turnover savings, trying to hire Title I aides and pairs that are, that are out there. Um, and then the supplies and service line is a, is a big number for us, about $12 million, and we, we anticipate saving about $1.4 million in that line. So all said, again, expenditures will exceed uh, budget by about $1.6 million, which will leave us an ending deficit of about $1.6 million. So that's about $700,000 more than what we started the year with. Um, our, and again, this is a fluid budget. So this is as of February 1st, it's just our estimates. We'll continue to look at this on a monthly basis. Uh, hopefully um, the weather turns better and we'll recoup some of the cost um, and have a little bit better number. Um, this is an analysis that we do on a regular basis. We'll use this to come back to you maybe in May to republish the budget if we have to. Uh, if you remember when we when we did the negotiations and presented to you in September, there's always that possibility that we have to republish the budget as part of the state statute method. Uh, we would do that in May. <coughs> and that concludes it. Do you, anybody have any questions? Questions from board members? Yes, Mrs. Owsley. Um, so I have a couple of questions. What, first, why did special education decrease? Just out of curiosity, what happened there? Special education in revenue? Yes. The way you submit your estimates in May, and you always shoot high, because the, and then they come in and do the audit the following year, and then they take away based on what your actual expenditures were. They will not give you more money, but they will take it away. So if you estimate too low and your costs are higher, they don't make that up. The state does not give you extra money. So that makes sense? So Yes, so we so conservatively estimated maybe a little bit higher and yeah. Gotcha. You do. Um, and then, just to be clear, the Title I funding discussion that Dr. Fulton had before you began was for next year, and the Title I line item here is for the current year about an expense regarding Title I that we were unable to cover out of the Title I funds that we were putting in the general operation budget. Is that correct? That's okay. correct. Yep. Just yep. so that that is, so that someone doesn't look at this and say, oh, that's left over from whatever was, right, that's no. a totally separate thing. Um, and then, just out of curiosity, how did supplies and services go down to that degree? The 1.3? 1.3 million? Yeah. That is, uh, it's a big number, and many departments budget for that, and they're budgeting for services that they anticipate that they will have, and if it, if it doesn't come, if it doesn't materialize, then that savings usually falls out. That's a pretty typical number that we is fall it? out in this size of the budget. And we, we You've heard you talk about recapture fallout. We budget anywhere about 
around five to eight hundred thousand dollars a year on money falling out in that line. So this is a little bit higher this year. But so and then so the ending deficit is one point six million. And so then my next question is likely more appropriate for Stuart Little, but Mary's here and not him. So <laughs> I mean what we, I know we briefly discussed with regards to inflation and what we anticipate potentially getting next year, and we it's all a guessing game with regards to how that works out at this juncture, but the state has to have its finance plan for education in, we think, by March, according to what the AG wants, but then what the legislature actually does might not be till April, April. and then that goes to the court for approval, and then if everything goes well, we might get does anybody want to have an estimate on that? But, but want to make sure that we delineate between this year and next year. Yeah. Right, right, correct. Right. For next year's services. But yeah. if we're running a, a deficit of this nature this year. You have to make it up. Right. Before you get any benefit. Correct. From increased revenue. Oh, sorry, so you have is, to make is, it up. Is what I'm saying, is benefit. someone understanding what I'm saying, or am I just? Yeah, if, no, you're no well, that, okay. that's exactly right. Yeah. No. yeah. So if, I guess if, if we're trying to see that we're going to get maybe three million additional dollars, but we've got a $1.6 million deficit, then that means we have like what, the 1.4 going into the subsequent year of what we would be getting. Right. Am so, I? So Senate Bill 44, mm -hmm. if it goes through as is, we're estimating uh, 4.5 million additional revenue on what we already are building into our 1920 budget. Okay. Thank you from the that English will, major. That will help quite a bit. And to clarify, and that's next year. Does that's the 1.6 carry over to next year, of which an offset, or it, it's all factored into a new budget for the next year? Well, it carry it carry fours into your fund balance. So yes, you want to use your 4.5 million to help offset that 1.6 million off of deficits because you do, you want to you want to level off. You want to stop the deficit spending. If we end up deficit spending this year, it'll be three years in a row where we've spent more than what we've taken in. Okay, thank you. And I want to point out that I do have a wrong number on this slide. That 11,318,000 in ending fund balance should be 12,639, and I've got that update. I just picked up the wrong number before I came in here, so I apologize for that. Okay. Dr. Sinclair. Um, so I'm going to piggyback off of Ms. Owsley's questions, but um, so um, first of all, I want to thank you for your. Um, capacity to try to do as much precision budgeting as possible with such a dynamic system, particularly in where federal and state dollars um, land, so thank you. My question might be more for um, Dr. Fulton. So if, if you can help me connect some dots, the, um, the way I'm kind of thinking about, um, we knew this deficit spending was coming. This is not, we kind of talked about it last year. Right. It's not something that we want, we can sustain. Um, but in part, one of the reasons why we kind of delayed some of the decision making, to me, seems pretty evident in your previous report that those decisions to get our spending and our revenues in alignment really impact how our district is operating, how it connects with our strategic plan. And so part of that deferment was to wait until you were here to help inform that decision making. Is that kind of a correct assumption of? It Why is. we kind of deferred this till now, but we're going to move forward without continuing and we need to move forward with reducing that deficit spending. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, once we get this strategic plan in place and even as it's developing, it will help to inform what our practices are going to be moving forward. You know, one of the things that I think we've already modeled is this notion of where we can um, reorganize ourselves to save money, we, we will. And those are hard decisions to make. They impact people. Mm -hmm. We recognize that. Uh, there's a limit to that, however. And so at some point, it's going to be absolutely critical for new uh, money to come into the district. And when that happens, make sure and look at the strategic plan and to ensure that we're spending money in ways that supports that plan. Okay. One, one yes, more. Dr. Sinclair, go ahead. Follow up. And so next week, we'll be hearing again. I'll at that point from our um, uh, Dr. Little, who might have some more insights for us as a community as well of how we might communicate with our state legislators about securing the adequate funding for our public education. That's yes. right. Other Thank board member you. questions? Mrs. Zila. Russ, I was just wondering, do you have a feel for the percentage increase in like utilities and transportation for next year? Is it 
transportation will be 3% because 3%. that's contractual. Right. Uh, utilities, we don't know yet. We haven't heard what uh, KCP&L will be given as far as rate increases. Okay. We will bring it on two new buildings, though. We'll be bringing Aquatic Center on and the new Brookwood Elementary School. Okay, so costs would increase anyway, even if yeah. rates remained flat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other board member questions? Yes, Dr. Sinclair. Well, um, the, um, I'm gonna ask a question that might be deferred to answer, but the, um, when some of the budget shows expenditures to like um, capital outlays, so TRAN comes in and looks at HVAC and those kinds of things, I would imagine when are we bringing people in that part of what that work is doing in our heating and cooling and utility, use of utilities is trying to economize and maximize yeah. how our facilities run. So we're, are we actively trying to Be efficient. minimize, right, so that we're minimizing those increases that we incur every year? Right. Absolutely. Yes. So, okay. That's good. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Russ. Thank Appreciate you. the update. All right, <clears throat> move on to item 2.05. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge and welcome any students that happen to be here as part of a, uh, a class work that they're working on. It's a government class or anything like that. Anyone here to, uh, as part of a government class? <clears throat> okay, they're all sandbagging and waiting till the end of the year. We'll see them in May oh, and April. There's one student. <clears throat> oh, oh, there he is, there he is, thank you. Welcome, and what school are you from? Great, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <clears throat> With that, we'll move on to public comment, which is item 2.05. I'll read a quick introduction, and then we'll welcome our four patron guests to the podium. Uh, public comment section is a time for public comment to occur at the regular meetings of the Board of Education, and it provides an opportunity for individuals to address the board regarding school district issues. Here are a couple of reminders to help our speakers have a constructive and positive experience when presenting your comments to the board. Please proceed to the podium when your name is called and share your name, your city of residence, what schools <coughs> your children may attend, and the name of any group organization you are representing. Uh, please limit your remarks to three minutes. Um, in consideration of everyone's time, if there's a group spokesperson that wants to represent the group and share their interests, the other speakers could pass if they so choose. A couple more. Please make your comments uh, while standing behind the podium. And uh, if any comments pertain to an item on the meeting's agenda, the board president may ask the superintendent or a designee to address those comments at that time or when it is an item on the board for discussion. And generally, the responses from the board members during public comments will be limited to any clarifying questions. And with that, we have four folks today, and our first one is Liz Meidel. I am a parent of two children at Briarwood, and I want to start, this isn't on my notes, so I'm going to have to talk really fast because I'm going to take time away, but I want to start by saying how incredibly thrilled I am with the strategic plan and with all of the work that's happening around um, moving money. Essentially, I think everything looks so amazing. Um, and now I'm going, to, I'm going to talk fast. Tonight I'm going to talk about Briarwood and the district's facilities department but I'll be back in two weeks to share about the systemic issues in special education and human resources. And then two weeks after that, I'll be back to talk about other systemic issues involving discipline and principal oversight. I think we can get better in lots of ways. I'm here with Brian, Jennifer, and Max today, and we have an issue with the playground at Briarwood. They are gonna talk about the on the ground situation, but I'd like to share with you about the process that has led to this moment. I've given you a timeline for reference, and I have copies for anybody here who would like them. In October of 2015, the board approved a contract with J.E. Dunn to construct Briarwood. When the original Briarwood was demolished, the rubber, rubble from the building was mostly removed, but the rubble left from the demolition of the playground was not removed. In January of 2017, when students moved into the new Briarwood, approximately 75% of the playground was unusable. My understanding is that the contractors, both J.E. Dunn and their subcontractors, were supposed to remove the rubble, and, but they didn't do it, and it seems that nobody here at the district made sure that it was done. 
In the spring of 2017, the district attempted to seed the playground without first mitigating the issue of the rocky debris, which still littered the majority of the surface. There are several bids in board docs from around this time for seed, most of which are in the $20,000 range. I have no way of knowing which of those was for Briarwood, but we do know that to seed that large of an area would be very expensive. But because the soil wasn't prepared properly, the grass did not grow. For more than a year, the district did not do anything. Briarwood has over 620 students, 629 as of this morning. We are well over the intended capacity of our building and playground. And the teachers regularly have to keep our overcapacity student population in from recess because of the lack of usable green space, and, um, which means that our playground is not accessible. In June of 2018, a contract was signed with the company to install sod. The contract is worth $43,736. In the fall, the company did not install the sod. We have talked to Bert Fell, the owner of the company contracted to do the work, and he's promised to get the work done this spring, but has also affirmed that his company is not contracted to prepare the ground or remove the rocks. If they arrive and the ground is not prepared, they will not lay the sod. The ground is still not prepared. The other thing that could happen is that they will think the ground is okay because right now it looks kind of level thanks to all of the snow and they will lay the sod which will not root properly because of the rocky debris and we will have wasted another attempt to make the playground green. Bob Robinson and I have communicated about this issue via email and he has framed it as an issue that has not progressed as the Shawnee Mission School District anticipated. If my kids were given an assignment and they responded with that, I don't think that they would get a pass. I would like to know what assurances I can get from both this board and the cabinet that the students at Briarwood will have a playground to play on this spring. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. With that, we'll bring up Brian Lee. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Brian Lee from Prairie Village. I have a pre-K daughter and a son, first grade, both at Briarwood and I'm a uh, proud Briarwood alum myself. Um, I've been a homeowner in the Shine Mission School District for 15 years, and I've gladly supported all the bond issues to support our school district. Um, but the lack of foresight and attention to detail will give me second thought to supporting future bond issues. Uh, Briarwood is a beautiful building that we spent millions on, but somehow we left a chat pile for a playing field. It's been two full years since the building's been built, and we still don't have grass for the children to play on. Um, I can't speak for the other building projects, but I hope Briarwood's the only one without grass. I ho hope we've learned some le lessons. Uh, it's embarrassing that we've dropped the ball for so long on planting some grass. It's, it's not rocket science. We've gone through four full growing seasons without getting the project done. Um, furthermore, we, we have uh, newly planted trees at the school that are, are now dead. I don't know if they weren't watered. I don't know if there were guarantees on them but they've been dead for a full year, still standing there. I'd like to get them removed and get some new trees planted, get them so they're watered, so they grow. Um, one last detail is we built this beautiful school, but we only put a bike rack in for 10 students for a school of over 600 students. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, the, the original bike rack that they put in was on, on the east side no bike racks on the front where most of the students go in. At the end of last year, they uh, put in a bike rack in the front um, for an ad additional five bikes. So usually there's a pile of about 20 bikes in front of the school on the grass um, any nice spring or fall day. And someone had the foresight to spend money to put in a concrete pad and a bicycle rack for five additional bikes. So. It'd be nice to get some more bike racks so we can encourage our students to ride bikes to school. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Next up is Jennifer Blattman. <clears throat> Welcome. Hi. Um, my name is Jennifer Blattman. I live in Overland Park, Kansas. I have two children that go to Briarwood. Max is with me tonight. He's in third grade. And I also have a kindergartner. 
I would like to ask your help in getting grass on the field at our school. Our 629 students need grass, green grass, and a safe play area. I'm going to talk about three points tonight, or try to. Um, one, providing a suitable play area should be a priority. We have been without approximately 75% of our designated play area for two years. They have not cleaned the site and removed the sharp rocks. They have not grown grass. They have not provided adequate play area for our kids. I think it's unacceptable and embarrassing. My son and I spent an hour and a half scraping ice off at the playground a couple weeks ago so that the kids would have a place to play. Um, my second point is that kids need exercise to be healthy. We need to fight obesity. They need an area for sports and for free play. The blacktop needs to be cleaned when it snows. The green field needs to be green so they have a place to run and jump and play. According to the CDC, in the United States, the percentage of children and adolescents affected by obesity has more than tripled since the 1970s. Nearly one in five school-aged children, the ages six to 19 in the United States have obesity. Let's keep our kids healthy and give them a place to get exercise. My last point, we need green space, an outdoor area for our kids to play. They need to be able to connect with nature and explore the trees, the birds, the butterflies. They need to be able to use their imagination and they need to be able to have time for free play. I wanted to read an excerpt from National Recreation and Park Association study called Green Parks, Green Kids. The concern is that a generation with no connection to nature will result in people who are primarily sedentary and have little concern about the environment and the world around them. I want our kids to have green space. Please help us fix the play field for our children. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up we have Max Howard. Can I stand with him? You him? bet. And make sure you bend the microphone down too so that uh, he can do that. Max, thank you for being so patient. You've been here for over an hour, and that's a really long time for all of us, so thank you for your patience. I am Max Howard. I live at, I live at 5520 West 86 Street, Overland Park, Kansas. I go to Blywood Elementary, and I'm also here to talk about the grass. Pretend that you're a kid who's balling and feeling you can't go get your ball. I've s I see kids fall and get hurt. When it rains, it gets really muddy. Tons of kids like soccer and they want to play it on the field. One kick one night, a softball team was playing on the blacktop kick by air because the field looked off and was too, too dangerous for the players. The field has been like that for two years. If we had a green field, you could play tag football, or you could just roam freely. When I heard that they were that they were trying to go grass, I wanted to help. I started picking up rocks with shovels and hoes, but there were too many. I hope that you can help. Thank you, Max. I appreciate it. And uh, that wraps up our public comment section. I'll turn to Dr. Fulton for any follow-up comments. No, we'll be happy to uh, follow up with you, and um, you can look for some response from the district in terms of doing a, a specific follow-up to your concerns. Our goal is to have grass on your playground <laughs> as quickly as possible. One caveat, it needs to warm up a little bit, but and we all know that, but we're, we're, we're working to get, uh, get grass taken care of for you, so thank you. Great, thank you to all that uh, came forward today. We appreciate hearing from you. With that, we'll move on to item 3.01, which is a communication program evaluation. Dr. Fulton. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna have uh, Mr. Smith and his team present to you the communication program evaluation. Good evening, board. Uh, as the team talked about presenting to you, you have a document that's in board docs that gives you a formal description of our work. But we thought that we would talk about our work in using a method that we use all the time. We thought we would tell you a story. We're going to call that story a day in the life of the communications department. 
and we're going to pick a random day, um, in this case a Thursday. We thought we'd pick a day that didn't have a board meeting because our lives are chaotic and board meeting nights. Or a snow day. Or a snow day, exactly. <laughs> um, we're going to pick a Thursday, and as frequently happens, the day begins with a call from a, a principal letting us know that the building doesn't have uh, power. Um, those things happen. When that happens, we immediately get to work preparing a communication to go to families. We strongly believe that we should do that so that the principal and the rest of the building can focus on the care and safety of students and staff. So that's how our day begins. And our day continues with the identification of stories we want to share with our community. Every week, our team is out in schools capturing stories about students, teachers, and staff. First, I'll assign a team member to some of these stories. Brad Dutton from our team will cover a video on fashion design for our recruiting series for career and tech education. And Tom Stevens will cover the Health Partnership School-Based Clinic Birthday Party. And today, we'll plan on sharing a student coding project at Blue Jacket Flint. And we'll also share a story about three signature program students who, because of their life-saving training, were able to put their skills into action. Let's take a quick look. The thing that hit me most was she asked me, are you a doctor? And I froze for a bit just because I'm in this program and I really love every place that I've been to and I love medicine and I love what I'm doing. So when she said that, I froze and I just imagined my future. So once the stories are posted on the district website, we also make sure that they are shared on Facebook and Twitter. Throughout the year, we work to reach every school in the district and so far this year, we have shared more than 200 stories. Many of our stories are supported with videos, thanks to our amazing and talented videographer team. Our videos, which are shared across social media, regularly receive thousands of views. Even as we speak, Clayton Turntine is making sure the board meeting can be viewed live on the web and is available for archive viewing later. Thank you, Clayton. While this is a daily snapshot, our team provides video and AV support for numerous events across the district, including the annual Foundation Fall Breakfast, where we host 1,000 guests featuring more than 300 students and sharing 12 stories on the stage and in video. It's our team that captures the graduation ceremony, making sure family members who can't attend can watch live and that families have a video of this significant milestone. Picture this, more than 2,000 graduates with 16 <coughs> crew members at six high schools in three days. But back to our day, and as Clayton knows, it's a Thursday, so it's time for our video crew, including Owen Denniston, to head over to film the longest running quiz show in the area, Categories. So I wonder how many of you have ever watched Categories and played along at home? If you haven't yet, <laughs> tonight's your chance because we have a question for all of our board members here this evening. And the next question goes to you, Shawnee Mission School District board members. And the category is categories. And it is multiple choice. Since 1981, how many episodes of categories have been broadcast by SMSD? Is it A, 5, 1, 2, B, 72, 35, C, 1,424, or D, an infinite amount <laughs> of episodes. Well, we do everything by consensus. The so board, <laughs> what do you think? I feel like the family feud right now. <clears throat> I believe 512 might be a little too convenient. Okay. All right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say D, we might also rule out. Yes. Uh, I think John, John's good, but not yeah. definitely good. I mean, <laughs> statistically, C is... Your best bet when I you don't know. So. We'll go and see. <laughs> okay, I, I can think we phone I, a friend? Phone <laughs> a friend, yeah. Phone a friend. Can we just ask John for a tell? <laughs> Who are we phoning? <laughs> Sarah. I, I think I hear the consensus is, is C. The consensus is C. That is correct. Well done. We'll have to do a special episode of Categories featuring board members. 
Um, and I do want to point out that categories is educational in more ways than one. Um, through this show, we have uh, broadcast students from the high schools join us frequently so that they can gain some experience in broadcasting skills. I'm with most of our video crew at Categories on this Thursday. The rest of us will be heading over to Sunflower Elementary, where we're helping to host the ribbon cutting ceremony of their new outdoor classroom. Many of you attended this event or the opening of Lenexa Hills Elementary, where we also um, provided event planning support. Plans are underway for the dedication of Brookwood Elementary in April and the retirement and service pin ceremony in May. But as far as events go, our sights are set on the next school year as we celebrate 50 years as a unified school district. We'll celebrate with staff at the beginning of the year and with our community at the 2019 Foundation Fall Breakfast on September 5th. So please save that date. And as our Thursday winds down, our final task is to decide on the feature stories for our spring edition of Inside. This magazine is published online and is also delivered directly to more than 100,000 households within our community three times a year. Both the breakfast and inside would not be possible without the talents of our graphic designer, Mandy Lavelle. She supports the communication department, but also many other departments and programs in the district. And none of this would be possible without my colleagues Kristen Babcock and Laura Harsh, and uh, also Judy Blankenship, who is our administrative assistant. We do this as a team. It's a lot, but we work together to make it all happen. Going forward, we obviously this work continues, but there are two things we'll be focused on this spring. Strategic planning is going to be a huge area of focus for us. We want to make sure that the work of strategic planning is shared broadly and that the community feels connected and engaged with the process. Also. Next year begins our 50th year as a school district, and we're excited about celebrating that and finding ways to celebrate the remarkable history, even as we plan for the future. We'll stop and give you a chance to ask any questions that you have. <clears throat> questions from the board? Yes, Dr. Sinclair. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I would imagine one of the challenges of uh, being on this team is how to balance word that gets out through social media and trying to respond with an informed um, update from the district. Can you maybe speak to that challenge a little bit? Or are there things you would want us to know as a community? Sure. Um, right. Given the broad, ubiquitous nature of social media, mm -hmm. it's probably not possible to respond to everything that's out there. One of the things that I've noticed over time is we have a remarkably engaged community and frequently members of the community who are informed will share that and will say, well, actually, here is what's happening. Um, and so if there is something where we are informed and we, we know it's, and it's a simple response, then we do. Social media is probably not the, the best space for deliberation for, for back and forth. But when we can share factual information, we can. We also work very hard to when things happen, we want to be able to tell our, particularly our families. So we work hard, we talked about it at the beginning, to support our schools in getting information out that is timely and accurate. And there was that latter point that I was kind of thinking of. So if a parent is hearing something the reason why there might be a delay, even though they might have heard something on social media, would be in part because we need to gather the information, make sure, right. take a breath. Right. So and and on, like it, that latter part sure. that I just felt like that. Well, if you, you know, recognizing that our, our kids frequently have technology with them, and if something happens in a building, that information can get out immediately. We're not going to put out information until we are clear on exactly what's going on and how we're responding, because that just leads to more confusion. So sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, but we try to do that quickly. Thank you. Any of the board member questions? Thank you very much, not only for the presentation, but for all the work you do for the district. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
We've been at it for an hour and a half here. I'm going to take a liberty and ask that we have a five minute recess and then we reconvene at 730 with a quick break. move on to item 3.02 and that's the uh, board policy committee this is a discussion item and not an action item um, <clears throat> I've provided to each of the uh, board members uh, a one pager at your table only because these are the notes that I was putting together to begin this conversation I thought it'd be helpful for you to have it in front of you in case I don't <laughs> articulate it that well but what we're in the process of doing last, the last two meetings is we've created the structure and the definitions around um, really five entities and a reminder that there are uh, board committees, board task forces, both of which are going to be manned <coughs> only by board members, and then there'll be district committees and district task forces that will be supplied by both patrons as well as bo board members. And then the fifth entity is uh, superintendent advisory groups, which we already have up and running. Of the other entities, the only things we have in place right now are board task forces, and those are the groups that uh, we talked about earlier, constituent services and professional services. So we're beginning the next step in this process to begin to identify some committees that would ultimately plug into the, the, the larger uh, governance process to help carry out the work of the board. We're doing this at the same time as the strategic plan is being constructed and developed as well, so we're being very mindful of that. But through discussions, both last meeting and then up to today, one of the thoughts was to say, well, the first group that we should begin to identify to do the work of the board, so a board committee, would be a board policy committee. Because ultimately, we are charged, as our role as elected board members, is to, carry, to adopt and carry out and update or amend board policy for the district. And so that's one of the primary functions that the work of the board does. So <clears throat> what I thought I would walk through was last, last time we identified and we said that the, the, those are the five definitions and that the board president would appoint those to each of the, appoint board members to those committees. A couple of things came up and so I'm going to walk through each of these but then I'm going to double back to the top because I want you to think about them as a whole. So if you hang on, we'll walk through it. One of the things we didn't talk about was um, the length of committee membership, meaning is it a, a one-time appointment to a committee and then it's reassessed at each um, new term? Is there a process that we'd like to th consider, meaning is there going to be a rotational process where that over the course of time every board member serves on each of the different committees over a period of time? Is there a seniority process? The legislature uses a seniority process to determine who participates in which committees or perhaps is there going to be an equitable distribution process where if there are 10 tasks to be done by the board and we chop it up evenly and I'm <coughs> or I'll say 12 to say then there might be with the president not serving on the committees each other board member might serve in two capacities so there's an equal distribution of the roles I'm going to pause there and say does that make sense I'm raising a question without really defining it because I want to make sure that we're all clear on how we begin to build structure to place folks on committees. I'll pause there. Any thoughts about committee membership and committee tenure? Yes, Dr. Sinclair. Um, so uh, you are not at this point making a recommendation, but you all. are identifying what other processes are used in other board or elected official capacities. So you're not advocating for anything in particular, but just kind of trying to define what else is out there and how those. And what, what the board members think might be a productive, efficient, and equitable process to serve on committees. So <coughs> do you want to deliberate about that now or continue to well, get Well, that that's a good point. Let's pause because these others play into that. The next one is uh, to selection of committee leadership. Let's just say the public policy committee is a three-person, three-board member committee. At that point, um, I, I want to know what board members think about is it the, is it the board president that also selects the chair, much like our state legislature does where they select the committee members and they select the chair? Or would it be such that the president selects the members of the committee, like we already defined in our process, but then turn it over to the members of that committee to select amongst themselves to see who the, the chair is, or perhaps even a rotational model again there. <clears throat> All of this is layered in with one additional curveball, and that is that uh, 
Um, our terms end, as far as the leadership cycle goes, June 30. So everything that my role as the board president will be will only take place until June 30. And then, um, unless state statute changes, we'll have a new election for board leadership. Curveball number two, the state legislature is currently considering a bill that says they might move the election process from the July of each year to elect your board president and vice president to January or another time in the year that the board chooses. <clears throat> Again, we don't need to chew on that one tonight. We're all mindful that that legislation is, is bubbling through the process. But I, I, I enter that into the conversation because ultimately we're going to be making some decisions in this interim period here that may or may not be affected by what board, uh, what the state legislature does. So, so with that, I'm going to go back to the top now and, 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 and reintroduce the question about um, both the length of board membership or committee membership as well as that rotational model. I, I put in there one year term because the presumption is, is that each year, as defined in our world by a July 1 to June 30, that the committees are assigned, the roles are assigned, in some case we elect some board members to specific roles. Is everyone comfortable with that on a one-year renewal basis? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So when we had discussed specifically a policy committee, one of the discussions with that was we, to have a formal process to have policy review done by the board because we don't really have that arm of the board yet. And, um, you know, different board members might have different policies that they're interested in. and in, my mind, I was thinking that if a board member was interested in a specific piece of policy, that they could rotate into that committee so that they could be there to have that conversation with the other people on that committee. And if it's a one-year term, then if a board member not on that committee has a question regarding policy or has a policy that they want to discuss with that committee, then are they effectively delayed for a year in having that conversation? Or do they have to give that conversation up to the members of the committee and not participate in it? Um, so I think those are questions that I would have with regards to that. I could see for continuity's purposes, like having whoever the chair was of that committee be a one-year appointment because, I mean, like with Deb on the Professional Services Committee, she's helping coordinate everything. She's organizing all of us. She's sending us emails reminding us when we have to be somewhere and do something, which is super helpful for me. Um, <laughs> so I see that role. Like, I don't mind that being a year. That makes sense to me. but. Um, if there's a board member that has a particular interest in a certain policy and having that conversation, I would want their perspective there so that they can bring up their points with the people who are tasked with reviewing it. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think I can explain that, but let me start with Mrs. Ela for your input. Go first. ahead if you want. Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> in my, I envision a process <laughs> where, just like this, the legislative process, where the committee members receive suggestions from all other legislators. So it's not tip just the people on the committee that are considering and bringing forward policy. It would be all seven of us have the opportunity in conjunction with the superintendent and the staff to provide um, <coughs> policy updates, policy changes. And then it's the committee who first works the language of that, and then the committee brings it to the board. But Specifically is what happened with public comment. Okay, all right. Um, right, but when we did that, the people who worked on public comment wanted to be working on public comment. When we kind of shuffled those around, we said, well, what are you interested in working on? And you can work on it. I guess with regards to the legislature, you're talking about a body of 125 people. It's not realistic for all of them to be able to carry every piece of legislation that they're interested in. But when it comes to a board of only seven, I, don't, I, I just know that there are specific topics of interest that each of us have, and I would hate to not have that voice be at the ground floor of a policy conversation and for that voice to be delegated to the rear end of the conversation. Well, let's walk through an example. And again, we're talking, I guess this is helpful because the, the example is the policy committee structure. So we'll, we'll walk through the public the policy structure, policy committee structure. So if we have three board members that, that sit on that committee, then they're charged, and we're going to get to that in a second. That's the other part that's in the, the agenda, is the role of the policy committee. But as an example, <clears throat> any board member and a superintendent can bring forward any policy item, whether they're on the committee or not. And then there might be a process, if we determine it, that let's say a fourth board member not on the policy committee is advocating for something to be considered. They certainly could attend and present. 
Um, we'd have to talk about four board members being in a meeting versus three, but that they certainly can do that, and that's why I use that legislative model again as the example is, is legislators are many times going to other committees that they're not on to advocate on pieces of legislation that they're considering. Uh, so it isn't, I think, I think the key to the policy committee is the policy committee is the vetting instrument as opposed to the prioritizing instrument. It's, it's the vetting process that says, this fits what we're trying to do from a strategic plan. This, is, this fits to what we're doing prioritizing for our district, cleaning the language up, doing a lot of the background work, and then bringing it to the board for consideration, as opposed to maybe prioritizing policy. I'll, I'll turn to Mrs. Zila and then to Mrs. Mack. Okay, and then. Um, just my thoughts on this. Um, I, I don't see any big hierarchy. In, this is like a standing committee, right. I believe, right, is what you would kind of equate this with. Um, I think three people that are interested in policy and want to work on that would be would be good. I think each year that can be revisited. Maybe they're maybe they're just policy gurus and they just really like that. So I, I don't think that they should be precluded from continuing on that committee. Plus it's nice to have that cohesion of like how we address this and what we do. Um, my my thoughts on what we're doing there as far as if you have like if it's a policy review, if it's a total policy review, you usually start with what probably the newest, whatever statute changes you have, that's where you would begin with and updating those. And then you'd probably start at section A and work your way on through. So it's very evident as to what policies you're talking about or you're reviewing. So if you have input, great. Or and you can do first and second readings. And you know, if somebody has some points that they would like included, <laughs> I think I'm humming, um, you know, they can certainly be taken into consideration then. I don't know that, because like you said, there's the fourth board member, we suddenly have an open meeting, it's not just a standing committee meeting any longer or whatever, so I, I don't see hierarchy as an issue, I don't see seniority or just that that everybody has to serve on policy at some time because we'll all be involved with that when that mm -hmm. comes to the board to be voted upon. So, so you're saying continuity might supersede those other things. I, I agree, yes, I think so. And, and it might be you get on there for a year and you go, I never wanna do that again. You know, Just bring it to me and let me know what your recommendations are. So that's a possibility as well. But um, so I, I, I hate to see too many parameters put on this. One, one year, I think every year it should be revisited just like we revisit a lot of the other committee commitments that we have, so um, I have no trouble with that. The seniority, I don't, I don't equate us with the legislature really, so I don't see that as a as a needed. Um, so that's that's kind of the my vision of what this committee could be because we've never had one other than um, when we went through after we did an entire policy review via. KASB, they sent it back to us and they had some policies there that it's like, this is not something that we want to embrace or even feel we needed, so they were discarded. That was vetted by the policy committee and brought forth to the board. So um, that, I guess, maybe that's the basis of my thoughts of what this committee could be. Thank you. Mrs. Mack. Um, I think there's one caveat we talked about doing the board manual under this committee as well. And I do believe there is a provision in the board manual that says we're supposed to do it, start the review in June. So I think that is in the board manual. So there is a little something we have um, in writing now. Um, my thoughts are a lot in line with what Deb's talking about. Um, but we all know right now and over the past year specifically, I've set a couple of memos to the superintendent and, and to, you, to Mr. Stratton on certain policies that aren't quite right, similar headings, some that are out of sync. And so I, as I have brought them, it's been, okay, we're gonna do a policy review, but those are, in my mind, would be priority because there's things that are out of sync right now. Along with, for example, the board manual, there are certainly things that need to be corrected and, and updated in that. Um, Seniority, I, don't, I, I agree with Mrs. Zila. As far as when, I think it makes sense to look at that at our organizational meeting, whether that is July or December or January or whenever we decide April Fool's Day, I don't know. Um, because then you can get, um, as the officers are elected and then representatives for KASB, et cetera, are elected, you can see how 
um, the responsibilities will lie for people and whether how busy they are, whether they want to serve on certain committees, et cetera. So it makes sense to me to look at it all at once or you, invite, you have officers and then the next meeting you look at committee assignments so that people can kind of reflect and see, oh, that is gonna happen so I probably should focus on that. Um, as far as chairmanships, it's been our practice um, that the president has selected the chair of the, not only our, our new policy says that the chair, the president of the board appoints the members of the committee. It has been our practice, although unwritten, that the president also appoints the chair. And if that is something that we want to think about changing, I would task the board policy committee to look into that to see what the best practice is. And that's this whole chicken and egg thing. Yeah. If I could hold on just a second, because I think we've got two conversations morphing into one. So if you give me this real sure. quick, I'm going to read the other part that's actually in the public portion of the agenda, and that is the actual role of the policy committee, because mm -hmm. I think we're, we're touching mm -hmm. on some of those. There's a draft language. This is just a first rough draft Dr. Fulton and I had worked on, and it says the role of the policy committee is to conduct the annual review of all board policies to ensure the policies are up to date, support the strategic plan of the district, and are in accordance with the federal and state statutes. This is to be done in conjunction with the superintendent and legal counsel and informed by KASB. Establish a policy review schedule and set policy review goals. Conduct an annual review of the manual of the procedures of the Board of Education, the manual that Mrs. Mack was referring to. Evaluate suggestions for board policy that come from board members and administration and make recommendations to the board. Review recommended board action on those policies, not specifically in the purview of another board standing committee, and other items assigned by the school board, the president, or the superintendent. I wanted to read that part in too because we're kind of morphing the two conversations together. Yeah, I had one more addition, if you don't mind. Um, I do think that this policy committee needs to get going I mean, uh, fairly soon for the reasons that I stated in that. I think there are a couple policies out right out there that need some, some visiting quite soon. But the second reason is, is I, I, the second thing I wanted to say is that I think this is a, a great committee for in-house counsel to possibly um, be a part of, since a lot of this is statutory, et cetera. All right, Dr. Sinclair. Oh, okay, so a couple of comments. Um, I would uh, I would concur um, that I don't think seniority or um, is relevant kind of in determining um, participation on various committees, um, including the board policy committee. Um, and I think it's worth at some point having a conversation about the role in terms of vetting policy versus setting priority, how we how that committee, what get, how the priorities of policies that get addressed by that committee, I think is kind of worth um, clarifying a bit. Um, the other thought I had, um, I think interest plays a role in, in um, uh, where we kind of put our additional time, um, but for some, it, it, for me, almost in every committee except um, board policy. To me, this seems a little bit different because policy really drives what we do as a board. That is kind of core to how we make our decisions is the policy that we establish for our district. So I almost feel like we do need to have some equity or some, you know, even if it's not anybody's particular top interest, I think it's important that we all kind of rotate somehow um, on that rotation on that board um, just because I I think it is important that we all have a good appreciation for policy. Um, although, Deb, I also think continuity is really, really important. I, you know, I don't have a solution. I just kind of have some criteria that are floating around in my mind. Um, and so the, term, the, the length of time that board members sit on this committee might be different than our other committees. Um, to Heather's point, maybe there are some particular issues that we all might have a background in or a passion about. So is there a way to, I don't know, provide some flexibility in that rotation to allow for that participation? So I have all sorts of thoughts, but no solutions <laughs> at this point in time. And, and that's why I put a one page list mm -hmm. of questions because I had those mm -hmm. as well. Yes, Reverend Guy. Well, one possibility maybe um, is to do it similar to the way we're doing a gender review where you have two people who are on the committee at every meeting, but then the rest of the members rotate in. So if they did have a particular policy they wanted to bring to the committee and be there, they could do that on their rotation time in. 
you still have the continuity, but then you'd have the others would have an opportunity to bring the policies they wanted reviewed. I like that. And even mm -hmm. swap out with others if, yeah, I like that. Okay, thank you. I'm writing that down. Others, thoughts, questions, both about this, this process to develop committees, which this would be the first one, but secondly, um, specifically to the, to the language around the roles of the policy committee. Um, I very quickly listed what their role or their function is going to be. <clears throat> I wanted to give it some guidance and structure before we task them with this new role. Um, additional thoughts. Let me tell, let me, let me add this and we'll continue the conversation in that we don't meet again until March 25th and so this is the time because of spring break we have a full month and so the idea would be to take this conversation here, bring it back together and, and, and put together a proposed policy to create a policy committee. Um, Do you need a committee for that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, because of the policy we Go ahead, passed Mrs. last time, do we have to do that? Or you just, I mean, I thought the, the, the president, according to our policy that we passed, the president can form that. Am I mistaken? No, no. I would just like to give it some formal structure. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Others? Yes, Mrs. Owsley. Well, and I just have one quick thought that's percolating as well. Um, over the course of the last year, several constituents have reached out with various policies that they're interested in. And so it would be nice to be able to bat to the chair of this committee to say, this committee is in charge of vetting policy and, mm -hmm. and reviewing that. Um, but also then making sure that, you know, how does that process work with, if a constituent raises it, then is that then the agenda of the policy committee or is that you know I guess there's lots of thoughts I have with the practical implementation um, yeah and that's a good good question part of the language that I've used for this initial template was grabbing about five or six other districts around the country who have that and, and put that in there and so um, <clears throat> One of the bullet points says evaluate suggestions for board policy that come from board members and the administration and make recommendations to the board. I think in that suggestion, certainly a board member and or administration, but to, before it gets to the committee level, I would anticipate that it first goes through this vetting of the administration so that the administration would first be chewing on the applicability of that. How does that relate to the, the priorities identified in the strategic plan and then say yes, this is how we can do it. And I'll give you an example, um, the, the, the change of policy around um, our food services. I mean, that came from the external, uh, the outside, and, and came through a process. And the administration spent a lot of time developing the, the facts and the statistics and the processes. And then eventually, if we, we didn't have a committee, so it went straight from that to eventually the board. So that, you, that example would be where the committee would then take it and, and work it, so to speak, to, to put a priority on it. And so it's not to prevent any, but I would really want to make sure that that committee, when they chew on things, would be first vetted or approved at the, at the administrative level. So do you imagine that approval or vetting happening no matter where the policy recommendation is coming from or just from constituents? I would think from, from any, but I would like Dr. Fulton to chime in too. No, that makes sense because one of the things that we'll have to do in any pol development of any policy is look at, sorry, development of any policy is what statute requires, obviously, and if it's, there's no specific statutory requirement, then we'll have to make sure that there's a framework that works, that functionally works. And the, and the, the, uh, the one that we did on food service is a good example of that. It took some research to determine what's, what's the potential intended and unintended consequences of that policy and so on. So that would be an important part of the review process, review and development process. And I can understand having a review and development process. I guess my concern would be you could end up with a layer that would then potentially have the ability to decline debate or discussion on a policy if the policy was controversial or something that was seen as not, not of interest of anyone else. And so I would be concerned that that could be used as a tool to not have a policy discussion if someone didn't want to have a policy discussion. <clears throat> Two thoughts, and we're doing this on the fly. Okay. Um, <laughs> we also have an agenda review process, and the agenda review mm -hmm. is developed first by the administration. We also seek input of other board members, and then the elected president and vice president 
work with the superintendent to determine the prioritization of what, what can be dis, uh, discussed for that meeting or what can be brought forward. And that would include that. So <clears throat> what, what, what makes the math interesting to me is that a committee of three policy folks isn't a majority of the board. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really convenient that, that, a th that three folks can really work on and coalesce around a policy, but ultimately they wouldn't go to the board with a, already a built-in majority because they'd need a fourth vote to, to get it across the line. So, no, I don't think it would preclude any of that. Um, and again, ultimately, the currently the president and the vice president make the decisions as to what goes on the agenda for consideration. Yes, Mrs. Mack. Just as a follow-up to that, um, not only would those uh, concerns be brought to agenda review, but any board member has the responsibility to bring anything to an open board meeting as well. So I wanted to make sure that that was brought forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Sinclair. Um, I, I would, um, I'm just kind of trying to think through the process. Part, part of what is coming to my mind is um, also a, a little bit of um, not so much if, but when is kind of what's percolating in my mind. So as we're embarking on this strategic planning process, um, I can think of a number of issues that I feel really urgent about, but recognize we can't do everything at once. We can do pieces and try to work towards this ultimate goal. And so in an effort to all be rowing in the same direction, I mean, we are going to have to set some priorities. Um, so I would hope that both of those mechanisms that you're talking about help us collectively identify how we prioritize things towards the ultimate goal of achieving those three objectives that you all beautifully just defined in the strategic planning process or however those mm -hmm. play out. So mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like we have checked the balances, I guess is what I'm trying to okay. say. And all right. Additional input on this. So um, next steps, we'll develop the language for consideration at the March meeting, um, both the definition of the policy committee as to its roles and responsibilities. Between now and then, we can certainly, if I'll seek input from any of you regarding these other items that I also raised, where, for instance, uh, committee leadership, this rotation, I wrote down <coughs> this potentially an agenda review rotation as an example, so, but those don't need to be uh, finalized at the first part. We need to first create this committee and get them working. Um, so provide input as we go along, but I appreciate your taking the time to do this on a long night, including one that includes a basketball game that's now begun. <laughs> um, any last comments on that discussion? Thank you. With that, we move on to item four, which is the consent agenda. Um, I'll first turn to any board members to see if anyone would like to remove any items from the consent agenda this evening. I would move approval. Thank you, Mrs. Zila. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Owsley. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda as outlined in the agenda, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. That passes 6-0. And that moves us to uh, item five, which is the action items. 5.01 is the adoption of board policy BB, school board legal <coughs> status. I turn to Dr. Fulton. It's yours. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to have Mr. Knapp come forward and Provide an overview for the board of what this policy is all about and why it matters to our constituents. Okay. Well, as you know, we, have, we are required by state statute to review our board member voting boundaries once a year. Um, we've switched to doing this in February. So the last time we did it was last February and we updated the board policy. Um, so I get information from Johnson County Ames and they give me uh, the census information in any voting precincts that are changed. And so I have updated that and then recommending only just three changes. Um, North and Northwest will just swap a precinct. And that, that became available because when we changed our board boundaries for 1819, there's a little area that um, was brought back into Northwest. So that precinct will now go to North. In Northwest and it keeps everything pretty status quo on the percentages because we we're supposed to give <coughs> due diligence to each uh, area by state statute so <clears throat> so in the grand scheme of things the percent breakout pretty much stays the same but we're just gonna flip-flop um, two for North and Northwest and then this one in South only had one person in it so 
we're going to put that up in the west. <laughs> so to clarify, this is not changing any boundaries of any attendance. Nope. This is for where folks vote based on the precinct to which they reside. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Mack. Mr. Knapp, I don't want to put you on the spot, but every um, election cycle, this issue comes up. And I know uh, particularly, I'm elected from the Northwest area, and there are many gracious people that live in the West area that end up having to vote for a Northwest representative. And actually, there was a candidate who, who ran from the Northwest area but lived in the North Attendance area, but he couldn't even run for office for his own high school boundary because of where he lived. Mm -hmm. Could you address that just overall so people understand, so that we could get some kind of understanding? Yeah, you, so the statute does not allow you to split precincts. So you got to keep the precincts whole. And then you're supposed to, then it's our task mm -hmm. to um, have equal population among our five high school boundaries. And so that's on that, this memo is attached to the board docs if anybody want to look at it. And then our other goal is that we're not supposed to have deviate 5% above or below the average mean. Um, and so we teeter on West, because West has our largest population, and to try to keep the precincts in the, the voting area that is the student attendance area, you try to keep that as whole as possible. And um, so what we have now is like West is about 105%. Between North and Northwest, that boundary that runs kind of along what, Clavira or Flum, there's all kinds of, we had to pull precincts from North in the Northwest to, to uh, bring Northwest up within the, uh, uh, the 5% threshold. Does that answer it? Well, I, I mean, I think that any explanation um, helps people, uh, our voters so, and our patrons understand. Yeah. Um, I also, we are, are we the only school district in the state that votes by, we vote people out of districts? I don't know that. And we, I do, uh, we, do we also pay extra for having our elections out of, I believe we pay $150,000 extra in election, is that correct? We have to pay for an election if it's not a county-wide election. Which are It's not because of the way we're, it's not because of the method. Oh, it's not choose. because we're out of the five feeder patterns and no. then the two at large? No. Oh, okay. I didn't no. understand that because I knew we always paid extra, but I didn't, I thought it was because we were specific to boundary areas. No. My understanding is that we, we pay our election expense um, if it's, if we're driving that election. So if it's a, a like county, a yeah. county wide election, then cities and school districts can piggyback off of that and there's not a charge for it. Dr. Sinclair. Um, I, it was kind of an elaboration though of Mrs. Mack's question. So if, um, if you're one of those parents or patrons who is stuck in between kind of on those opposite sides of the boundary where your voting precinct is versus where your home high school area, you know, kind of district boundary area is, there's kind of two issues. One is voting, kind of voting for your board representative, and then there's also folks who want to run for school board mm -hmm. in their home high school area, but are kind of on the opposite side of the line mm -hmm. for the voting precinct. So who has jurisdiction over making those decisions? That is state statute. So any potential resolution to that conflict, would that have to be taken up with the legislature, or does the district have any authority over how that plays out does that and this might be a question we need to research I don't mean to put you on the spot no, so good. maybe it's a question for further investigation um, yeah I don't know how to answer that yeah, I don't I'm know sorry, specific I, yeah, enough. it's a good question that. and we don't know I yeah, think so we'll find out so, so what, I would, what I would say is into? it is not the purview of a school district to define correct. the ward and precinct yes. lines nor can we insert ourselves in that conversation correct yeah. so Ultimately, the, the onus would be on us to redefine our attendance areas based on the predefined precinct lines. That's the only way we could get them truly to sync up. But unfortunately, there are some large populated precincts mm -hmm. with students that, that tip us over in either direction. Therefore, we've got several precincts that slice in half. That's right. And, and, and I'm turning to Michelle if she's over there because I know she spends lots and lots and lots of time on this. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that, that's, that's the tricky part, is, okay. is we are second in the decision-making process. The first one is that these precincts and, and wards are created, mm -hmm. and then we have to try to best draw our lines according to theirs. Yeah, it would be very difficult. To, uh, we would be continually adjusting our attendance which boundary not, lines, which okay. is not desirable. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Ela? I think my questions were really answered, I, and I think Russ answered it. If we drive a primary or something like that, force an election due to you know, multiple candidates or something, that's when the onus is on us to pay for that. Yes, Reverend Guy. So two years ago in the school board election, um, I had heard from several people who went to the polls intending to vote and discovered that they couldn't um, because they, were, they lived in the West Attendance area, but that wasn't where their voting area was. So I just wanna make sure that if voters go to the Johnson County Election Office and put in their information, the sample ballot that comes up is the accurate sample ballot that they will have so they can know before they go to the polls which school board member they have the opportunity to vote for. Is that correct? Yeah, you can, I think that's a question for, for the Johnson County election. Well, you can or, do that online. <laughs> you can go online and put in your address. And it right, I just wanted to make sure ballot. it matches up with now this new information. So, well, I'll, I'll provide, if you approve this, I will give the changes to the Johnson County election office. Okay. They will flip these precincts for the boundaries, right. so they keep that. So you, they'll see who they um, um, can vote for. Okay. Um, you said that they don't get the vote. I'm, I think that's what you said, but I don't think that's what you meant. Everybody well, gets to vote for at large. For the at large, yeah. And for that member, it just might not be in that their election. boundary. Right. So right. they might be that living area. in the west, but they'll be voting for somebody in the north. Right, west. right. But their intention was they thought they were going to get to vote for a representative from their attendance area. Yeah. And that didn't happen that election, right. so yeah. And that's because we can't get these boundaries perfect. Because right. our attendance doesn't match up with voting. Right. Mrs. Helsley. Is notice sent to the voters when we flip them? So will we provide information to those patrons telling them that we've altered this? And so for the one fellow who lives in the South area who's being moved <laughs> to West, Will he receive a postcard informing I'll him? I'll give him a call. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, and uh, for that one guy, that's not that big a deal. But for some of the precincts that's, that are larger populations, um, for the people who are impacted by this, I mean, I imagine that. Um, well, I would assume Johnson County will send that out. I don't think at, you can make that assumption. Well, not not based on what we're doing, but when it comes election time. Well, they'll get a notice of where they're registered. Where right. they're register to vote right. and where they can go vote, but that doesn't mean that they'll, they don't get a sample ballot in the mail from the election office. All they no. get is notice of where they can vote. So if they aren't notified by can't us. can't you get a sample ballot on Johnson County Elections website? You're talking about the election. All right, yes, you can get a sample ballot, but I would say that it is highly unlikely that the average voter checks the sample ballot um, with the intention of determining whether or not they're going to continue to be able to vote in an election that they previously voted in. So if you have someone who was districted to vote in the North area, now districted to vote in the Northwest area, and they don't receive notice of that, I imagine that contributes to some of the consternation those folks feel when they walk into the voting booth. And seeing that it's, I, it strikes me as ex extraordinarily unlikely that the Johnson County Election Office will notify these folks. Do we have the ability to notify them, to let the impacted people know that they've been moved? I mean, we can, well, it, we can a, identify people in precinct. That's all sure. Secretary of State information. We obviously know which neighborhoods of our boundaries are changed. I mean, even can, if it was just can, an email or a robocall or a postcard. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if we did get involved in notification, it would probably have to be by postcard to that address. Right. Because we wouldn't have contact information for all of the households. And that's and assuming you don't have all the addresses. Sorry, so. And in conjunction with the Johnson County Election Board, because we, can, right. we cannot be proactively contacting the voters with information without also getting their, their sign off on that as well. I do hear what you're saying is though, if yeah. there is no mechanism for proactive, how can we work towards proactive. It's something we can I mean, we Maybe can't we take. should we talk can't. to the communications team. No, no, we, <laughs> no, 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 talk, no, no, no we, it's something that we can look into and see what we could do in conjunction with Johnson County to communicate about the change. Um, I don't know. This is so, such it's an unusual structure. It's a small percentage structure. of folks, so I can't imagine that there is an extraordinary expense affiliated with the 
Yeah, it's a, it's a known. Informing people. And it just seems like that would be a courtesy. It seems like it would be a courtesy on our part to say, here's your heads up. And if you've received a heads up, then that's all. Oh, we can certainly look into it. Okay. Any other additional questions about the proposed uh, board policy change that we'll take action on tonight? Just yes, Dr. Sinclair. I want to drive the comment home that this is a state statute that we are responding to. So the change is in compliance with the state statute because we as a district have chosen to do a combination of at-large and area representation. Well, not, I mean, we, we represent, we, each of us represent all district members, but we choose to, we choose Anyone to. Anyone else? Do it this way. I'll seek a motion to approve. Okay. Make a motion. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Dr. Sinclair, uh, and seconded. Thank you, Mrs. Mack. All those in favor of the proposed policy change, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. That passes 6-0. And I can't pa uh, pass up this opportunity to ask uh, Russ Knapp, would it be helpful in the future to have a policy committee assist you with this process <laughs> in the future? Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I got assigned, for, assigned to it because of all the number crunching. I, yeah. <laughs> And thank you for that. All right. Thank you. Um, we move to item 5.02, which is the uh, discussion for Dr. Fulton around administrative contracts. Contracts. Sure. Uh, every year about this time, we uh, approve administrative contracts. This is not about compensation, but rather about extending uh, the contracts for one or two years, depending on the position and the individual. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. You've been provided that information. Uh, any additional questions about uh, approving the extension of the contracts as presented? And I, I will add this, and any compensation is addressed uh, after negotiations. Thank you. Dr. Sinclair. Um, so uh, have any of the um, recommendations being made in this agenda item, do they reflect a change in practice at all? They do not. Uh, we have gone to uh, one and two year contracts continuing what started last year. But other than that, it's not a change of practice. Thank you. Other questions about the proposed contract adjustments, updates? Seeing none, I'll seek a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Zila. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Mack. All those in favor of item 5.02, the approval of the district level administrative contracts, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. And that passes 6-0. We move on to item 6, which is board comments. I turn to board members with comments. Yes, Mrs. Mack. I know there's a ball game on. I'm a Jayhawk, married to a Wildcat, had two Wildcats, but I have a couple things to say just really quickly. And that is, um, Last week, or last meeting, we did um, journalism uh, proclamation, and I know the editor of the North newspaper is here tonight. And Grace, I just wanted to thank you for always sending us the North newspaper. You are the only high school that I consistently get the newspaper from, so whenever you're in a joint meeting, if you could please encourage them to, I mean, I really read it and it really helps learn what other students are thinking in other areas of the district. So if you can encourage other buildings to do that, I would really appreciate that. And I think that'd be great, because I think other board members would appreciate it as well. Um, secondly, there is a, a Shawnee Mission Education Foundation donor um, dinner this Wednesday night, and there's a lot of fine people that um, give to the foundation, and, and um, they go to the bistro on Wednesday night. So I think that's a lovely occasion, and I hope it goes well. Last meeting, I also said, um, since I will not be here when Dr. Strike retires, is he still here? He is still here. So I just wanted to say very quickly, um, I won't be here when you retire, and I wanted to, to say something to you very quickly. Um, when I first met you, I felt like I'd known you my whole life. Um, you have so much knowledge on so many things, but you light up when you talk about track and field, when you talk about your family, and when you talk about your belief. And um, it, it's amazing to me that you treat everybody with respect, with so much respect, but more than anything I've noticed over the years that you always put kids first, always. There are absolutely no exceptions with you. You always put the students first. Um, 
I hope that students and parents and other people that don't know you and don't know your story over this next year ask you your story because I think it is a powerful testimony to the great man that you are. You are a walking miracle every day. And I think that your story could touch a lot of people. Um, I feel really blessed um, to know you. The district is stronger because of you. And um, whenever I think about you, I just think about your great heart and the heart you've given to Shawnee Mission and all of us here. So I won't get to say this a year in, uh, plus from now, but I wanted to say it tonight. So thank you. Great, thank you. Other board members? Yes, Mrs. Owsley. Um, so I just have two quick things. The first is that um, I've been volunteering with this metro area Kansas City Climate Coalition, and one of the nicest things about that has been learning about um, what uh, leader Shawnee Mission has been with regards to sustainability and green energy, and um, Joan Levins is here tonight, and I know she's done the <coughs> significant amount of heavy lifting on that, and I appreciate that, and we have a climate summit coming up in September, and we are looking for a student panel for discussion on that. So if there are any students that are passionate about this or have implemented things in their districts, I would love to hear from them so that I can give them <clears throat> work to do. Um, and then also on the policy review, just to put it out there, I know um, one of the things I would hope that the policy committee could look at would be potentially updating a uh, non-discrimination policy and our bully bullying policy to make sure it's in line with all of our obligations under um, federal <laughs> statutory and regulatory requirements and local ordinances. Um, so I know Patty just said, you know, we all have an obligation to say that, so I'm uh, say what policies we'd be interested in. So I would, I'm just putting that out there so that folks know what I'm thinking about in the back of my mind when I talk about that stuff. And then um, <laughs> finally, once again, I wanted to just say thank you again to everybody who participated in the steering committee and I'll stop so we can get out of here. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? I can't let the, uh, the, the item on the calendar go unnoticed. Um, this past week marks uh, a one-year moment where this board was working very diligently to the point that uh, we were honored to make a phone call to Dr. Fulton to ask him to see if he'd be our new superintendent. And so that happened uh, one year ago this past week. And so we are grateful for you saying yes. We have enjoyed the journey with you. I can't believe it's been a whole year. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you for your service. And I wanted to recognize that that took place one year ago. And with that, our next board meeting is March 25th. And uh, it's odd to say, but I guess we're not meeting until after spring break. Please have a, a safe spring break. And I turn to Mrs. Owsley for a motion. I move we go into executive session to discuss personnel issues pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception under COMA and that the board will reconvene in the boardroom at... 9 o'clock? Is that good? Yeah. 40 minutes? For the first one or for... because there's two? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Great. So we have a motion to uh, move to executive session to reconvene at 9 o'clock at which there'll be no other board work done after that. I'll second. Thank you for the second, Mrs. Mack. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. What, I'm, I'm going to pause. Dr. Southwick. Is the motion on personnel or? To discuss litigation with our legal counsel pursuant to exception for matters. Yeah, because I said personnel because I read the first one. Okay. <laughs> to you. clarify, this is to recess to executive session to uh, re, re, uh, speak to. To discuss litigation with our legal counsel pursuant to Thank the exception Thank you for the for clarification. Um, how far did I get? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. That is 6-0 on the motion. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Good night. <laughs>